We'll kick it off. Anybody that comes in late can, can join us at that point. So welcome everybody who is here. I see a few more are rolling in right now. Um, for anybody who is already on or just joining, this also will get, this is being recorded and will be posted later uh, on the businessanthro.com site. So again, welcome. This is the New York Business Anthropology Meetup, uh, I, along with Julia Greinberg and Robert Moraes are hosting the meetup. And tonight we have a lovely panel with the authors of The Culture Puzzle, uh, Mario Musa, Derek Newberry, and Greg Urban. And rough plan, basically how we're gonna approach this. I'll give a little introductions after this of, of the guests, of the speakers, then about five to eight minutes, uh, we're gonna give each of the three authors an opportunity to talk about what they're really passionate about with the book. Then we, the hosts are gonna ask a couple questions and then we're gonna open it up to Q&A. So to kick off the introductions, uh, Mario Musa is an award-winning author, management consultant, keynote speaker, and executive director. He has taught at the world's leading academic institutions, including UCLA, Duke, the University of Virginia, and the Wharton School. He has co-authored The Culture Puzzle, which we're talking about tonight, The Art of Woo, and Committed Teams. Derek Newberry teaches and consults on human factors that drive performance. At the Wharton School, he leads executive workshops on interpersonal, uh, communication, collaboration, and corporate culture, and has taught various co courses on uh, teams and leadership. He has he is also the co-author of the Culture Puzzle and Committed Teams with Mario. And then Greg is has taught at the University of Pennsylvania since 1994. Specializes in cultural and linguistic anthropology, laws of cultural motion, and the ethnography of corporations, among many other areas. He's the author, co-author, or editor, I think, of nine books. Greg, correct me if I'm wrong, if I got that wrong, but um, including, the culture, right. <laughs> including the culture puzzle, again, which we're talking about tonight, and how, the, how culture moves through the world, as well as many other journal articles and, you know, in esteemed journals. So uh, thank you all for, for joining us tonight. We look forward to chatting with you. So to begin... And we can just kind of go right down the line. As we said, we want to give you maybe, you know, five, eight, maybe even potentially even 10 minutes uh, to discuss something you're really passionate about the book. That could be any particular section. We'd love to hear, you know, why you're passionate about it, why you think it's relevant. Uh, as always with our salon, we're, we're really trying to also make this um, relatable to, to careers uh, and the practice of anthropology. So if you could all, you know, jump in with that guide in mind. Uh, Mario, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Yeah. So I think you know, the last couple of comments about careers and practice leads in pretty nicely to the things that I want to emphasize about the work that, that uh, Derek and Greg and I did. And I thought what I might talk about is how I engage with clients. And there are four points that I, I wanted to share with folks about that. First point is, and this is something that we talk about early on in the book in the introduction and the first chapter is culture comes first is the, the way I like to put this point. And what we mean by that is you can't st stand outside of culture. So I, I find with my clients, like I'm working now with an engineering firm, uh, with a bank, um, I've been doing some work with a global beauty company and a number of other uh, kinds of, of companies. Often there's the idea that somehow you get your strategy right and then you get your operations right. And you get the, pull the financing together. Then you ask, okay, what kind of culture uh, do you want to have? But a, a point that I try to get across with our clients is, you know, you, it, you're always in it. Um, so culture is already always there. And I think um, that, uh, you know, kudos to Greg, I would say Greg really helped me understand that um, years ago when we started work, working together. So you're always in the middle of it, but um, as we say early on, quoting Bergson, you don't always know what you're looking at. And I think that, uh, th I think having a, a framework is really helpful. You know, that Kurt Lewin quote, there's nothing more practical than a good theory. And what we develop in the book is that, that four, uh, a four forces framework. I think uh, Greg's gonna talk about this more, but vision, interest, habits, and innovation. And, and at least in my work, my field work, if, if you like, that's a useful checklist. And, and I found that um, 
and Derek, interested in your th thoughts about this. Um, really, you know, clients aren't interested in theory, so I don't find myself talking all that much about the framework. But it is, it does animate everything that I do in the kind of uh, in my consulting work. So that's my first point. Culture comes first, and a, a big part of what I try to do in my projects is help help clients see their their culture. And then the second point is culture is about learning and adaptation kind of goes along with some of the things I, I was just, I was just ta uh, talking about. Uh, so it's about what happens internally in a company or an organization, but then how the comp company responds to the environment, customers, competitors, and so on. Um, and so how is it, how is it responding? How is it learning? How is it uh, adapting? Um, another idea that we talk about in the book is, um, we don't use this language, but sometimes we shorthand it as, is the three G's, you know, getting along, getting ahead, getting things done. And I like to emphasize with clients, culture is about getting things done. Um, they don't always see it that way. Um, but the work that the consulting work that we do is, it's very operational, it's very empirical. I've, I've been partnering recently the last few years with a, an anthropologist who's just really good at drilling down into specific client issues. And I'll talk in just a moment about, you know, about some of those, those issues. So that framework, the four forces framework is kind of, um, it's, it's in the back of our minds, but really we try to meet clients uh, where, where they are and the language that uh, that we've come to use recently that seems to be helpful is friction points. Uh, like my consulting partner started out talking about pain points, but you know, clients have so many pain points, it just gets a little depressing to talk about pain, pain points. So a lot of our work is using ethnography to identify those friction points and clients seem to respond to that language. And um, you know, I think of that quote from Dick Hackman who taught at Harvard for a long time, AP equals PP minus PL, the actual productivity of a group or an organization equals its potential minus process losses. So it's through you know, using that, this four forces framework or checklist that we identify friction points. It could be misunderstandings about where a company is going or feeling on the out, you know, you're not part of the in group or, um, or the wrong kinds of practices or values being reinforced when people come together or people not being able to speak up and share, uh, share new ideas. So like those would all be examples of, of friction points that are related to the, 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 our framework. And just as, as an example, um, recently I've been doing a lot of work with one of my clients on prototyping. So transitioning from prototypes to manufacturing. So we really drilled down into how decisions are made and how people have conversations or whether or not they're actually having the conversations they, they need to be ha having. And then uh, I've been doing a lot of work recently on digitalization with uh, the financial services client. And uh, that is interesting for a lot of reasons, but one is the CEO of this company has really taken this point to the, that, um, you know, culture is always about learning adaptation. So it's changing all the time. There are core values. Um, but, you know, digitalization became especially important for them the last year or so in responding to COVID with remote work and, and, and so on. So we've gone really deep into digitalization. And then um, with virtually all of my clients, you know, silos are an issue. I know that you all know Jillian Tut and her great work and, you know, our experiences, there will always be silos. And so identifying cultures within silos um, is, is useful. And then the last point, the fourth point is um, what we do is help clients, you know, the subtitle of the book is harness the forces that drive your organization's success. Um, we, um, engage in a four-step process that really, that mirrors those four forces. So we often start with uh, helping clients envision how they want to work, uh, uh, either big picture or specifically, let's say around prototyping or what's their digitalization 
uh, vision. And then we do, you know, we do interviews and focus groups and, and so on. And we listen in to what people are actually saying. Are they on the same page with, with leadership? And then we create forums where they have an opportunity to reflect together about, let's say, the vision from the top and what's happening throughout the rest of the organization. I think Greg would call that an opportunity to kind of engage in metacultural reflection. Um, and then we experiment and then we do it all over again after we learn. So these four points, I, I think, um, kind of get at how we apply the framework. So in, in that sense, Matt, you know, your folks might be interested in that because it's so much about the practice. So that's over to Derek, I think, next. Cool, so thank you, Mario. Building on that, I'm going to go um, a little deeper into one part of the framework that I really love. It's the, the first part of the framework, which is all about um, building a vision. So what I'll do is give um, three um, little mini examples that illustrate for us why the idea of um, vision, and we really think about that as creating a shared narrative, um, is so important and the role it, it plays in creating a shared culture. There's a reason it's kind of the first step of this um, process we lay out. Um, so the first example comes from um, some of my own recent work, like Mario, I do some consulting. And um, recently I've found myself somehow being involved in, in work related to diversity, equity, and inclusion, which as a white, hetero, cis, male, you know, every box of privilege you could probably check um, is, is not something I expected to be doing. And it's mainly been an opportunity for me to listen and learn and observe. But one of the things that struck me in some of the conversations I'm having with one, one company in particular that's, you know, looking to create its, its DE&I strategy is, you know, we've been talking a lot about representation and the importance of representation. So seeing you know, people at the leadership level who, who are themselves diverse and come from diverse backgrounds. And I had always thought of representation as something that was very important from the standpoint of like almost, you know, just going back to my days dabbling in vulgar Marxism in grad school, like from a pure interest standpoint of somebody is up there who is going to like promote the interests of people like me. And that matters. But one thing I've learned rather belatedly is that this, this phrase has come up over and over of, I want someone who, who, who I can see myself in. This idea of being able to see myself in someone else um, has, has come up quite a bit. And what started to occur to me is that that process of envisioning myself in someone else um, tells me that, that their culture is part of my culture, right? Um, and that somebody, not just who sort of represents me from sort of a political interest standpoint, but someone who shares my culture is a really prominent part of this company. And therefore, by extension, I am part of this shared culture. And if you think about it, like, what does it mean to really have a shared culture? It means to um, look at the people around you and see something in common with them. That something is, is culture in some ways, right? So in terms of, um, you know, going from that to, um, to uh, narrative, you know, what, building from that, what we found is, um, people talk about how, you know, not only is that about seeing myself in somebody else and feeling like I'm a part, we're part of a shared culture, but it's also that um, we have a shared story. So I can envision my own career trajectory landing where that person is, right? Um, so that kind of um, clued me into the fact that part of this idea of having a shared culture is also about um, having a shared story. So that's one thing. And then so pulling away from the business world to an example we use in the book, um, we talk about uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda and um, how he wrote Hamilton and what, what that early uh, process was like. And so what's really interesting about Hamilton, right, is it's, a, um, uh, it's a, an intentionally very diverse cast, right, um, who are effectively telling the story of, you know, this all-white group of uh, founding fathers, um, and, you know, Manuel, Lin-Manuel Miranda gets into a little bit of why that is um, when he talks about, you know, how, how he read uh, Hamilton's biography and how he came up with this idea. And he says, I'm just going to read a quote from him. When he read about Hamilton, his reaction was, I was like, I know this guy, this guy who comes to this country and is like, I'm going to work six jobs if you're only working one. I'm going to make a life for myself here. 
He says, that's a familiar storyline to me, beginning with my father and so many people I grew up with in my neighborhood. So um, just extrapolating from that one example to now, you know, what we get, I think, out of that Lin-Manuel Miranda example is if you look at actual sort of entities like corporations, or in the case of Manuel Miranda, Lin-Manuel Miranda, a nation, right, America as a country, as a nation, you know, what is it that really holds us together? And what is it that makes us, you know, uh, feel like we're all part of, of this shared culture, right? It's the stories we share. It's that ability, again, to see ourselves in the stories of other people that gives us this sense of shared identity and shared culture. And that's an incredibly powerful thing. It's what allows someone like Lin-Manuel Miranda of Puerto Rican descent and his fellow cast members, all of whom would not have been recognized by even fully human as the people they're portraying, to somehow still see themselves as part of the same national culture and natural national narrative, right? And uh, we thought about that, uh, the authors, uh, a lot as well as we were watching um, The Ascent of Trump, right? Um, so, you know, um, you know, if you, you know, look at the, the language people used to talk about um, their adoration of Trump, his supporters, his most diehard supporters, they also say things like, and, and you think about like this guy, how could anyone, how could like a, a working class person living in a rural area connect to someone like Donald Trump, who is this, you know, uber rich, New York, you know, um, playboy type guy. And yet people will say things like, he sounds like me, you know, I, I, I can see myself in him. I, you know, people connect with him on, on a really visceral level. And, you know, one way of understanding that is that they see, they somehow, you know, see them see themselves as part of the same sort of shared story with him. There's a shared narrative there. And, um, you know, what does that narrative mean? Well, there's been really great work by um, a number of people. One person I like in particular is the sociologist named Arlie. I've never heard her name actually pronounced, so I don't know what, what Arlie's last name is. I think it's Hochschild, who um, did um, deep ethnographic research in Louisiana. Coincidentally, at the time, like pre when Trump, uh, Trump was on the rise, but that was someone, this was someone who was able to sort of predict that Trump would really resonate with a lot of people in these sort of working class areas of rural America, um, because uh, what, what uh, she found was that what she called the deep story she was hearing over and over, a story of being left behind, of resentment, and there's a lot more there, um, was one that Trump was really able, even perhaps unwittingly, to connect to in a really powerful way and, um, and make himself a part of. And so what that tells us, I think, is not just the power of having a shared story and the role that uh, has in building a shared culture, but also the danger when we lose that shared narrative and therefore lose our shared culture. So I, I don't, you know, this isn't an example I bring up with the corporate clients I work with, but whenever they, you know, get the idea that, well, culture is just soft or, you know, it's, it's kind of a sideshow. I think if you look at the state of the country today, you can see how even dangerous not having a shared culture can be. Um, so that's why, you know, this is one of the things we really emphasize in the book. And, you know, if you, I think, look at the state of the country and look at the state of the, a lot of the organizations we work with, I really see a common thread of leaders who are kind of losing the narrative um, with their own people, who are losing that sense of what is it that connects us all together and how do I tap into that shared story and build on it? in a less serious way from the Trump example I just gave. I mean, even things like the pandemic, um, the fact that we're more physically distant, I hear that challenge coming up with leaders all the time that they feel like there's something they just don't fully understand about um, their own people, that there's a disconnect there. And I think that's a loss of having this ongoing sort of shared narrative about what is our company about, what binds us together and where are we going? So that's a little bit about why um, we start the, the framework off with vision, which again is all about building a shared story why it's so important and why it's so important for um, folks in an organizational space being a, bringing it back to business anthropology um, to um, continually think about, you know, how do we help our clients craft a shared story? If you're in a corporation or an organization yourself, do we all have a, a common sense of, of what that story is about, what we exist, you know, who succeeds here and why are we all sort of a part of it? Yes, I'm up next. 
hard act to follow, Derek. Uh, you know, it's, I do want to kind of continue themes uh, that both Mario and uh, Derek have raised, although, you know, I'm someone who's uh, deeply ensconced in the ivory tower up there. So, you know, I have to find my way out into the world. And I thought I would talk about that because early on, um, Mario posed the question to the, the three of us, you know, what did we hope to get out of writing this book? You know, and I thought about that and, you know, my answer to it uh, was in part that I hope to be able to learn to communicate with a larger audience and to convey some of the research findings that I've had over the course of my life uh, to people in organizations, not just in business organizations, but other organizations that might be helpful to them in, in making, uh, making life better, not only for themselves, but for the people around them. So that was really the goal, you know, I saw, and I'm a student of cultural motion. Uh, and so I'm very interested in the process of circulation, how and why do words circulate or practices circulate and in books circulate, how and why do they circulate and how would we write a book in such a way as to take some of the things that we have been doing. And I, I say all this being a relative newcomer to, in my own mind, because I've only been really doing you know, what I would think of as business anthropology for, you know, probably a little bit more than a decade now. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, how do we uh, take what we uh, know and how do we put it in a form that actually makes it circulable uh, to people outside of the academy? And so that's been a challenge for me. Most of my, all those books that uh, Matt was mentioning are so technical, you know, you pick them up and think, you know, God, what is this? Uh, unless you're a specialist in the area thinking about it. And so uh, it was a challenge for me to even contemplate doing this. And so the second part of my response to Mario is, well, I also want to study the process. You know, I want to do an ethnography of doing the culture puzzle and what that's all about. And I've been doing a little bit of that, not, uh, not a sufficient amount. But um, in terms of communication, one of the things I want to uh, mention is the importance to me of bringing in Kendra Allenby, who is a graphic artist uh, and who uh, has done cartoons for The New Yorker. Uh, and she works with business people to sketch drawings of processes that are underway. And I thought when I, you, well, uh, I guess, Bob, you are, uh, remember uh, her involvement in uh, the Global Business Anthropology Summit and those wonderful drawings that she came up with to represent what we had done there. Uh, so uh, I thought, yes, we've got to get her into this book. And it was really mind opening uh, for me to interact with her. And I think Mario and Derek probably feel the same, but we would tell her what we were working on. <clears throat> and then she would put that into a form, you know, that was a, a visual representation. And I, I use those now when I give talks to, I re most recently I gave a talk to uh, doctors who are also administrators in hospital systems, uh, 50 or so, I can't remember how many were there, but uh, I use some of her cartoons and they really resonate with administrators. And one that, uh, when I said it right away earlier today, Mar uh, Derek said, oh, well, yes, it's that one about the org chart. You have to see the one about the org chart, right? Because uh, when people look at it, uh, they first of all just kind of try to take in what it's all about but it is we had we had told her about how we are trying to develop something other than the idea that most managers have that you have an organizational chart and the people that work for your company are just nodes in that chart or maybe they're numbers and lines in a spreadsheet and so she she came away from that and she came up with this i don't know if you're going to be able to see it on the screen or not but uh she came up with this idea of a person down here looking at the, uh, are you gonna put it up there? Okay. I can actually share it, yeah. Okay, you're gonna share it, excellent. Yeah. So uh, let me see, I've got to get rid of this other thing that's out here, but yes, I don't know if you could see my cursor on it. No, probably not. But no, in any case, um, you see it's a regular org chart at one level, but here is a person that's actually involved with the organization looking at it. I'm pointing to it, you can't see what I'm pointing to. But it, at the top, you see things like, uh, the top of the uh, uh, the person had uh, took publicly took a pay cut, but still uh, has a gigantic salary, and the person below him friends from college fraternity, and there are other things like 
always trading funny cat videos and so on. And so you get a sense of the, the humanness. And there are so many of these that I love, you know, down below you see um, uh, these are online gaming buddies. Uh, and there's uh, over on the other side, uh, it says uh, afraid of getting fired, uh, the one. And then down below it says hoping to be fired. Uh, over on the right hand side, works part time 30 hours per week, works full time 30 hours per week. And there's a way in which she has of taking what we're talking about that seems very dry and, and kind of anthropological sometimes to me that doesn't have that kind of life attached to it and turn it into this really living form. And I have to say that that was also true of working with Derek and Mario who are so much better stylists, literary stylists than, than I, I will ever be in terms of creating prose that can communicate uh, with a broader public. And they would generate the stories and I would help them figure out how they, they linked up with the, the theory. So, uh, and we also had actually uh, worked with a, a professional writer who actually with the work that came out of uh, Mario's uh, hand, probably not that much tweaking ultimately was involved in it, but words here and there that, you know, maybe did make things resonate better uh, with, with the general audience. So one of the things I, I wanna talk about, so in addition to the cartoons and the general problem of the circulation of discourse and the circulation of a book of this nature, a self-help book, I wanted to get back to the, the four forces. You know, those are near and dear to me because I've been developing ideas about why culture moves through the world. And M Mario started off talking about it. One thing I, I would emphasize, uh, and I saw that there was a question about this already, but uh, that uh, culture develops spontaneously. It's like spontaneous combustion. Mario said culture is already there and yet develops like spontaneous combustion when you bring people together that have different cultures. This is something I think, Derek, uh, you have found, you know, in Mario working with the Wharton teams. Uh, that these little groups of five, six, seven people will generate uh, their own little cultures. And those that really work on developing that, and maybe Derek, I don't know if you want to add something to that right now about, I see you seems like you're about to say something. I'm just vigorously agreeing with you. I think we were amazed at how people could, you know, form in these, like you said, groups of six or seven or eight, and literally within a day have an incredibly strong sense of group identity. Right, so you know this kind of spontaneous combustion aspect of culture. And so my, my life's work really has been trying to figure out what are the forces that propel culture. And so when I talk about it, you know, I use words and I, I didn't use words like vision. You know, I, I used the word metaculture. Uh, and so how did we get from metaculture to vision? Well, you know, metaculture is a kind of, you know, expensive sounding word uh, that I remember one student telling me they love that word because it was a good way to pick people up in bars or something of the sort of you know, <laughs> college students. I, I can't remember what it was they actually said, but uh, you know, metaculture is reflective culture and we all know what reflective culture is, ideological uh, formations and so forth are part of reflective culture. But vision is part of reflective culture. It may not be everything that goes into make up metaculture, but it does go into the kind of buzzwords, you might say, that are important within the business world that take that concept and make sense of it uh, for people. And uh, Derek talked a, a little bit about that already, but uh, we start the book, uh, the first chapter, uh, with the story of Akhenaten, uh, which uh, is a story about a pharaoh uh, back from uh, second millennium uh, BC, and it tells the story about how he was a culture changer and he had a vision. Uh, and we go into the vision that he had for developing a new capital for the Egyptian empire, uh, for uh, creating a new art style, for creating a new religion. It was gonna be monotheistic religion and it all worked out perfectly for about 10 years until he died. Uh, and it turns out though that this big culture change which produced a whole new world uh, eventually collapsed. And why did it collapse? Well. It collapsed because the culture through habitual force, the force of habit, what I was calling in my earlier work inertia, uh, the force of inertia was carrying forward the old culture before the Pharaoh came along with his new vision. 
And so uh, people brought out their old amulets of their old gods and the statues started reemerging. And pretty soon, you know, you had uh, almost the whole vision uh, erased, even though the, this is an incredibly powerful figure. So, you know, getting from metaculture to vision, you know, that was something that we had to, to hammer out. Uh, getting from inertia to habit, uh, and habit does do a pretty good job of translating uh, many aspects of inertia. Entropy, you know, I always thought of entropy in as having two sides. It, you know, it has the side of things that hit us from out of nowhere, seemingly out of nowhere, like COVID. And what did that do to throw off culture? But on the other side, I think creativity is entropic in the sense that it actually bring stuff new that's unpredictable into the world. And will it catch on? Will it then circulate uh, once it, it's been brought on? So the idea, and I don't never remember when Mario and Derek and I got together for our meetings, you know, how the words popped up. You know, maybe it was Mario, maybe it was Derek who said, no, that's innovation. That's the word we want to use because that's the word that really resonates. So uh, we got from entropy uh, to innovation. Interest is the only one of my four original forces that carried over with the same term. <laughs> and I think that's in part because it's well known from economics, even though they really in economics generally till recently have been talking only about the tip of the iceberg when it comes to, uh, to interest and the depth of interest that Pierre Bourdieu and others have really brought to, to anthropology. So um, the last thing just to mention is, uh, that I think the, we, we worked on metaphors and what kind of metaphors people, metaphors are very generative of discourse. And so what kind of metaphors did we want to try to carry this discourse forward into the world? Uh, and we had the, the sun god, you know, from Akhenaten. Uh, and, but then we were thought, well, what is the, you know, what is the alternative to that? And uh, Mario, I think you were the one that uh, were talking about uh, the gardener image and, and developed it uh, most. The idea of tending a culture more in terms of a, a kind of set of forces that are at work there of nature, but that you can do some pruning here, maybe add water, things go on, you can eventually shape that in some ways, but it's got a life of its own. And so finding metaphors that actually resonate and communicate the ideas is something that I've been uh, really intrigued by in terms of working with with Mario and Derek on this book and that I think should hopefully be helpful for people when they're they working with companies. They certainly work for me when I'm dealing with administrators or people in executive positions and trying to explain to them to try to get from you know my, my book Metaculture to uh, my the co-authored book uh, Culture Puzzle. So that I think I'll leave it at there Pat. Well, thanks all. Um, appreciate you sharing, you know, the sections that you're really passionate about, and 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 how you kind of got from some of the original forces to to where you ended up. I guess building on that, especially on that last piece, and this could be a question for any one of you. You mention the term central idea, you know, in the book, and would for those of who are on who may not have had the opportunity to read it. How would you succinctly maybe say, what is the central idea of this piece? The central idea of the book? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <It's your. laughs> I think it's, um, I think I would, if I think I'd pick up Greg on your point about circulation. I, I think we don't, we don't use that language in, in the book, but I think the um, I think it runs throughout the book, and I think the metaphor of gardening. Um, and we're kind of mixing metaphors here, but um, it it's it's about circulation. That is, it's not culture is not static. I think that one idea that we were responding to is is that you know is that many many people clients often think of culture as like words on a flip chart or a website or, you know, a top team goes through a retreat and they come up with some ideas and, or a vision statement. But I think the central idea is that, um, you know, culture is always on the move. It's dynamic. It's reinforced in every encounter. You know, um, uh, Greg mentioned Bourdieu. I mean, I, I've been 
thinking about Bourdieu for about 30 years since graduate school. I finally found a way to write about Bourdieu, I think in a way that's uh, pretty simple. So I think it, it's that idea that um, we come together. I love Greg's idea of spontaneous combustion. Greg, I don't think I've, I've heard you use that before. So I wrote that down. I'm gonna, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna use that three times tomorrow. Um, but you know, it's like you come together, you know, like a group comes together and spontaneously they create a culture. That's how culture works. But then it's reinforced every time we have a conversation. Um, and so it just keeps coming back and it goes deeper. Um, there are countervailing forces like, you know, you know, Greg, what you originally called entropy or what we call innovation in the book, you know, new ideas. People go elsewhere, they come back, they have different ideas about how things should uh, should get done. Um, but I would say the central idea for me is that this idea of you know, kind of dynamic circulation, um, which is behind that process of learning and adaptation that's, that's happening all the time. Yeah, I would totally second that. You know, I do think the dynamism of culture and understanding uh, also that it's not something that is necessarily uniformly shared. So in its dynamic aspect, it moves around. Some people get maybe some aspects of it, other people get other aspects of it. And that it does uh, you know, take shape in these small groups, you know, as, we, as I was mentioning earlier. And uh, so I, I do think the dynamism though, thinking about culture from a dynamic point of view and from the point of view of the forces that are at work on it, uh, that's really the central the theme of the book for me. And just to round that out, you know, uh, for the the reader we were imagining when we were writing this, we, we were imagining speaking to a business audience and a business person who kind of understands culture as a, a thing you build, and their role is kind of the engineer in constructing and arranging culture and their people the way you would cogs in a machine. And so part of the central idea is speaking directly to that person and saying, no, you can't think like, like an engineer, what we in the book we call a sun god. You have to think of a little bit more like a gardener. And what that means practically is, is basically having a dose of humility. If culture is constantly changing in ways that we can barely grasp, if it's something that comes together so quickly and then takes on a life of its own, what that indicates is trying to fully control it is really a fool's errand. Then you have to have sort of a dose of humility in your leadership style when you approach it. If I could just tag on to that uh, idea, um, and you know, Derek, your comments and Greg's, and I think that where we have taken that in our field work and our work with clients uh, is um, helping them think in terms of an imagined community. You know, that um, which is a, a term that many political scientists and sociologists use, and I think that. Often, in fact, I was talking with a client today about this idea of an imagined community. I think what often happens is like a top team goes off and they are they spend a couple of days inhaling their own fumes. They've got this idea around culture. Then to your point, Greg, you know, they they somehow imagine that everybody's gonna have the same vision, but it doesn't work that way. So I think a lot of the work of coming together is creating that imagined community. And I would go back to Derek's comments about a shared narrative. I think that has a lot to do with a, a shared narrative, but I think it's, you know, it's always surprising, um, you know, how much of a slip there is between, you know, what we think in our heads and what others are really hearing. And I think, I think leaders often forget that what's so clear to them is, isn't really being picked up across the organization. In fact, most, there's just, uh, you know, all kinds of data that show that mostly it's not like, 70, 80% of the time people don't buy the vision or they don't believe in it or they think it's hypocritical. So creating that imagined community, that shared narrative is a big piece, I think, of culture work in, in companies from our perspective. Thanks. And so, you know, you've sort of nibbled around this a little bit, but if you're in a consulting engagement, how do you explain culture to say the engineer in a way that they kind of get it, you know, right? I mean, you, we've spent some time already tonight, you know, we've been talking for say 40 minutes, we've got to talk about some different ways of explaining it, some ways to sort of, you know, maybe um, bring it down from the ivory tower into more simple terms, but have you found anything that when you use, it really just helps 
you know, the traditional business community make sense of it and, and really help you sell the value of the work you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I would. I go yeah. So, Derek, do you want to? No, well, I, I, I think you have to, I guess, you know, as, it, as we were saying earlier, you have to meet clients where, where they are. Um, well, I guess what I would say, you know, I, I was really struck when the, when the book came out. So the book came out in June and, you know, there were a bunch of interviews, podcasts and, and so on. And even podcasters, um, they wanted to talk about culture, but they also had really specific issues that they wanted to talk about, like the response to COVID or working from home um, or going back to the office. So I, uh, Derek, I don't, I know you and I did a lot of those interviews and I found myself kind of migrating toward the, those topics. And, you know, I post every uh, two, three times a week on social media and it's usually about um, back to the office kinds of issues or the, the great resignation. So, you know, as I tried to suggest earlier, the framework, the four forces model, more and more, I think of that as for us and you know what we tried to convey in the book, which is um, which is story rich. I mean, it, it's like story forward. Uh, in the uh, there's uh, in the notes, there's an extensive there, there's an extensive discussion of the four forces and all the academic literature. It's there's a whole lot of theory embedded in those notes, but the book itself is stories and. I think, you know, to Derek's point, clients are interested in their story. Like, what are people saying? Like, oh, you know, it, it's hard for us to work remotely. Well, what are we going to do about that? Or uh, we can't transition this R&D idea to mass production. What are we going to do about that? So I think part of the art of consulting is getting cult, uh, comfortable drilling really down deep into those operational issues. So I think at least I find myself in my work, which is, I think, sh just shot through with culture, um, not talking about it all that much. I mean, it comes up, but really it's, it's usually, I, I find myself talking about what the clients are, you know, struggling with, you know, what, prototyping, digitalization, teamwork, engagement, and the way we work is, and I think this kind of speaks to the question that Patricia in the Q&A chat asked i think you know a lot of other frameworks are very abstract like the you know the hofstetter framework it's like you know chinese are this way and russians are this way but i think we start with what the stories that clients are are telling and build from there and say okay here's what we're hearing what you know why are these stories coming up what does that mean for what you're trying to do in your in the area of finance or digitalization or whatever the the the, the case may be I don't, so Derek, I don't know if that. I agree. One of the reasons I was selling is because I actually had to pause and think, and it, I actually don't find myself having to explain culture to people the way I thought I would maybe when I got into consulting, um, even though everything I do in some way is, is a part of culture. And I think it's for the reasons Mario described, you're always solving a particular problem. And it's more like, I know to think about that as a cultural problem and apply some of the you know, the ideas that, that we're talking about here to be really effective in changing it. But in some ways, it never has to come up. In other ways, when it does come up, it's, it's especially right now, I don't have to convince anyone of the importance of culture. When they see people thinking, you know, with really low morale, thinking about leaving, they get that culture matters. I find more of the challenges, they think of it solely in terms of like an HR thing of, engagement and morale and retention. And it's definitely all that stuff. But it's also, I, when I do have to convince people of something around culture, it's that it's also what you think of as the real stuff of your business too. It's how you make decisions, like that's cultural, right? Um, so that's more where the convincing comes in, not that it matters in itself. You know, I, I would add to that. I, I do have to all the time, uh, explain to especially the Wharton undergraduate students in my classes, uh, and I teach a class on anthropology of corporations and more recently on small business anthropology, but we have to talk about culture really uh, directly. And I think that one of the things that 
uh, most has struck me is the fact that people think of culture in a very kind of superficial way uh, as being statements that are put out, uh, for example, by the central uh, administration. So, uh, you know, one of the cartoons in the book uh, it, it speaks to that, uh, where you see a manager and uh, the manager's uh, associate looking on at the, uh, <clears throat> the workers uh, and saying, you know, I put out the memo yesterday that they were supposed to be happy. Why aren't they smiling? And so you see how, you know, the, the notion is that you can simply set up a set of rules like values and so forth. So what I usually do when I'm uh, teaching, and this is for teaching, obviously, and not directly in consulting, but what I do uh, for teaching usually is try to take people in exactly the opposite direction and talk about those aspects of culture that are so deeply embedded in us and they're part of our bodily responses to the world. I like to use, for example, the smile and the way in which, you know, smiling is something people do universally, yes, but they smile under different circumstances at different times and about different things. You know, so uh, the, the book, uh, Golden Arches East, uh, uh, the uh, editor uh, of the book talks in the introduction about uh, the ways in which McDonald's uh, in attempting to expand out of America where, you know, everything was to be made exactly the same way and everything was to be done exactly the same way. And that was part of the selling point. It was like, you know, Ford building the Model T or something of the sort. And so uh, when you take that to other cultures, it doesn't necessarily work. So in East Asia in particular, Golden Arches East, that people would uh, be suspicious of anybody smiling. So if the attendant were smiling, that could be a source for people to think, well, there's something weird about this. Or in the case of, of Russia, that maybe the person is laughing at me. Uh, and so it's not, uh, and I have a, a wonderful picture of uh, Russian students jubilantly celebrating uh, of some, something, and they're, uh, not one of them is smiling. It's really interesting that you could jubilantly celebrate without a smile. How can that be? And when it comes to consulting things, I remember when, when I first was getting involved in, in business anthropology, I, we had a talk at Penn from a business anthropologist, and she was working with a one of the high tech companies. And she said, you know, you, you, she picks up on things as a good ethnographer, right? You hear things and you begin to realize that certain words and phrases are being repeated over and over again. And one that she heard was the dog will eat it. And she was thinking, what, you know, why are people always talking about the dog will eat it? And eventually it really became clear that the company she was dealing with was run by guess what, engineers. And so they were interested in making new stuff. And in making new stuff, they figured people are just gonna buy it. Just the way the dogs can eat whatever you throw out there for the dog. And so it became part of that background way of talking, a shorthand way that was part of this culture that emerged inside this company. So you only needed to say that to end a conversation, you know, with <laughs> people talking about why, why are we doing this? Well, you know, the dog will eat it and hence it's gonna be successful. So uh, I would emphasize that there's so many ways you could take that. There are just many, many ways to go into the body uh, and get people to get a visceral haha, sense of uh, what culture is all about at a very deep level. Thanks. And you I, I actually want to just build on that a little bit further. Um, I want to ask you, um, you really stress quite a bit all of you, um, the value of translation. And Greg, you even spoke about how it was important for you and interesting to, to kind of find the right metaphors to communicate anthropological concepts in ways that are approachable, um, valuable, accessible to a completely different audience. Um, and in a sense, this book really does a great way, a really good job of speaking anthropology to business folks in a way that doesn't sound too um, academic or anthropological. Um, I do want to ask you though, you know, what do you find in doing this work and kind of translating anthropology into business speak essentially? What do you find or maybe hope or think anthropology offers managers that conventional business and managerial ap approaches do not? You know, in a sense, um, what does a cultural perspective add now that you've kind of translated 
anthropology into a vocabulary that's more familiar to business. Um, is there something novel here that's not already in the business, that's not already present in the business um, toolkit? Yeah, I would say right away, you know, that to uh, pay attention to culture is also to pay attention to people. And when you start doing that, you realize that people are what make your corporation work. And if you uh, don't focus exclusively on you know, the, the, the finances and the other matters uh, in a business, but you focus on what people do, you know, as uh, we were saying just earlier, uh, culture is a central part of that. Elizabeth Bryady and is, you know, gives wonderful examples of this uh, that we use one of them uh, in, in our book uh, about the way in which uh, it, at GM, General Motors, uh, people spontaneously uh, developed an exchange system on the floor under the push to keep the assembly line always moving. And they would sock away all these key uh, parts in their lockers and then they would trade them on the floor because that would enable them to keep, uh, to keep the operation going. You know, so, uh, you know, I, I think these are the kind of things that, uh, you know, are really helpful when it comes to understanding uh, a, uh, the, the role of culture that you get things done with culture as we'd like to say there are three things. You know, they're, they're getting things done and that's really one of the most crucial things. And, and culture, you, you couldn't really have a corporation uh, without a uh, business corporation, without having a culture that enables you to do something, right? The doing part of it. But to be able to do things, and this is from the history of anthropology we know, to be able to do things, you have to get along with others because our doing is based upon our work in collectivities. As individuals, we're not really very good at doing important big tasks. And we rely upon groups and our involvement in groups to do that. So getting along with others, culture directs your attention to the getting along aspect. And we also know that people have a need to get ahead, even if it's like work that I did with small uh, indigenous uh, communities in Brazil, uh, where it's incredibly egalitarian, you know, so you don't want to accumulate any wealth. I was so struck by this, and we have a couple examples in the book, but, uh, you know, by the fact that you, it's, it's kind of anti-accumulation orientation, uh, where that if you have more than something, some of something than someone else has, you darn well better give it away, or you may be thought to be a witch, uh, for example. And so that doesn't mean, however, that getting ahead is not important to people. It is important, you know, but you want to be the kind of person who's able to give to others. And so you want to put yourself in that position. It may be in a strongly egalitarian model, but you have an idea that getting ahead is important. You want to be someone who's known as being a good part, good member of the community. And if, you know, leaders can actually develop uh, that idea that you want people in your company to actually have the desire, you know, have the interest uh, in being good citizens of their company, uh, that uh, getting along is key to getting the results that they want, uh, in addition to the role that culture plays in the actual doing of stuff inside the, the group. So I obviously feel pretty strongly about that part of it. And that's actually, I think, my one of my goals too, in doing this kind of work is to try to make workplaces more livable and better places for people while simultaneously making them work better and do what they're actually supposed to be doing. Long-winded, I'm you, sorry. Yeah, yeah no, that, that was really good. Yeah, and Yulia, I think there were a couple of comments in the chat that are related to your questions. You know, someone asked about ethnographies, best ethnographies uh, that have pub been published since 2010 and uh, there's another reference to Epic. I mean, picking up on story, I would say, um, I mean, I, you know, again, the book is very story driven. And uh, so I think, um, I think the New Yorkers, you know, that some of the business writing in the New Yorkers, um, good place to look for. I mean, I don't know if you would, strictly speaking, they're not the F ethnographies, they're you know, really great journalism, literary journalism about business. I think John Cassidy, I think Seabrook, I think Cal Newport's been doing some really interesting writing about the office and working virtually recently. 
Derek Thompson in the Atlantic, I think has been writing some really good pieces of, about con uh, contemporary work. And then we tell a long story near the end of the book about um, a pharma company uh, and Paul Rabinow wrote uh, the ethnography there, um, Carrie Ellis, who's this, is it, or is it Carrie? I might, I might be Mr. Mullis. Mullis. Yeah, right. So he's just, just unbelievable, out of control, outsized character. Um, and he, you know, fist fights and drug taking and weird theories, but, uh, you know, a, a, you know, a standout scientist. Anyway, that's a, that's a great ethnography, but I would look to really good contemporary literary business writing you know so new yorker atlantic harper's that's where i go really and i think that that sort of spirit animates the writing in the book that's what we kind of aspire to and derek and i've done a lot of writing you know for fortune and entrepreneur and 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 so on uh so look for good storytelling i would say Derek, how about you? What do you think or hope cultural anthropology could offer, translated into business speak? What do you feel, hope that it offers business folks? Yeah. Yeah. So, there, I mean, a lot. One thing in particular that comes to mind we haven't touched on yet is the group, um, the group sort of level phenomenon that is often missed in traditional sort of organizational change or org development type approaches. So, I find that, you know, I do a lot of work with. People do like change management, things like that. And it's all like individually psychologically oriented. It imagines every person in an organization is like an individual autonomous unit that is like the recipient of things that come from elsewhere, right? That of you know, new strategic initiatives or whatever that come from on high. And the goal is to like reorient their psychology, I guess, to like get them to buy into something. And there's no sense that that change, that how, how organizations change and develop and how people react to things as a product of like a group level phenomenon that's not irreducible to any individual. And that's something that anthropology clearly grasps, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, no, that's great. That's uh, the emphasis on the, collect the collective is really one of the things I really enjoy about your work. Um, another idea that I really find interesting that you highlight here and so important, I think, to bring into kind of the business context is this idea that culture is messy um, and just the sheer messiness of the connections forged inside organizations or in, in, in inside of cultural units. Um, and I, you know, it kind of goes back to the, um, to the uh, illustration that you had just shared a little while earlier that kind of illustrates the org chart as a little bit of a fiction, you know, you have this kind of really standardized hierarchical org chart, but then you don't really see the um, other ways in which people connect that don't completely layer on to this reductive image. Um, so one question I have for you, I think it's a really interesting um, or an important kind of idea to, um, to surface, to, to foreground in business settings. How might you suggest that executives or business leaders incorporate this idea of messiness into their larger, you know, not just imaginary of corporate uh, or their organizations, but what might be the alternative to the work chart or where else, how and how else might uh, business leaders try to not just build in, but also represent that kind of messiness so it becomes part of the conversation in a more um, consistent manner. So I think one thing is to build more flexibility into the org structure itself. So like um, agile team structures that are really popular right now and they have been for a little while. Some say they're maybe overused, but I think what's cool about that is um, to just structure teams so they can almost autonomously decide what's important to them, bring in the right people, focus on the kind of work they want to do and just really rapidly check in and adjust and then make course corrections. And so agile is not the only way to do that, but um, I think building flexibility into your structure kind of enables you to harness the best of the, you know, the, the mobile nature of culture and the way it changes rather than trying to fight against it. 
And then I would say on an individual level, I, as a leader or really anyone in an organization who wants to get things done, I think cultivating a practice of um, listening is something that, that we advocate. I mean, it's something that Mario has been um, advocating, you know, from you know, early on in the in the art of woo, and and comes through really um, strongly in the culture puzzle. The idea that you very quickly lose touch with your people if you're not constantly, you know, basically connecting with them, walking the halls, and it doesn't have to be you know so instrumental. It can be just you know randomly catching up with them. But that's kind of how you keep a pulse on your teams and your colleagues and and keep a pulse on sort of the, what your shared culture is and how it's changing. I just wanted to use that hand emoji. <laughs> <laughs> um, but if, you know, what I would add is, um, I think the language of action learning, I found resonates with clients. And, um, you know, action learning is about solving some problems that the clients are, are dealing with. I don't know how many, how to, oh, there it went away. Um, so I think starting there, so like what we'll often do is um, begin with a problem statement. You know, uh, you know, I think a lot of the comments that have come up in the Q and A in the chat is, you know, how do you get clients down from this abstract level of thinking about culture and really talk about it in a way that's practical and engages them around the real work that, that's being done? So I think you know framing the work as action learning. So we're going to look at these friction points, these pain points, and then uh, we're going to write a kind of research statement. Uh, you know, like okay, here's 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 the issue, and then Derek, to your point, we're going to organize an agile team uh, around this, and folks are going to problem solve, and then uh, they experiment. Uh, you know, back to one of the forces that that drives culture. Then we step back and we reflect uh, in a metacultural way on the solutions. Um, and that I've found that uh, if, so I think there's a lot of work that can be done around action learning and, you know, lean and agile teams, you know, that's business language, I, I think, um, that you could use that kind of enables you to get into a conversation uh, with, leaders about problem solving. Um, one of our participants, um, Anne asked, you know, how do you convince a business audience that culture should come first when people may be more interested in, in pulling numbers, analytics, KPIs, and so on and so forth. So I think having a, you know, a platform, having credibility to be part of the conversation with executives is, is critical. So speaking their language or, you know, I do think having a book can help because sometimes people bring you in to talk about your book and that opens a, a door. But once you're in a conversation, I think with decision makers, finding um, kind of business language that you can be comfortable with and it enables you to do ethnographic work is, is really useful. So again, you know, agile, lean, action learning. I find that that kind of language tends to click with clients. Tim, to your question, you know, are, are there longitudinal studies? I haven't seen anything so rigorous. I can just tell you in my, I have done a couple of projects where I've built sort of agile or agile like teams. And I can tell you in those, in, in that work, the, there was a real effect on productivity. Like people were actually able to produce more faster. And they actually liked being part of the team more. They found their work more meaningful and more interesting. So we just one person's experience, um, but it would be interesting to see with organizations that move to those kinds of structures over multiple years, what the effect is. I'd like to pick up on um, something that Mario said about uh, friction points and also what Greg was talking about, about getting along, getting things done and so on. There are a lot of organizations, and you, and you touch on this in the book because you talk about um, uh, tribal conflict, uh, intertribal conflict, intra-tribal conflict sometimes. Um, sometimes personalities uh, cause conflicts and they can be very difficult. Um, my question to you is um, that there are some companies that thrive on conflict. 
that's how they get things done. And ultimately it's how they get along. You know, I have, I spent a lot of time in advertising agencies, the conflict within the advertising agency between say the strategist and the creative teams or the account manager and everyone and everyone um, ultimately led to pro greater productivity. It, le it led to getting things done. It led to, the heat led to some light. And um, the question for any of you is, how do you deal with, how do you get it exactly right? So that, you know, when you're working with a company, you don't want to completely erase the conflict because that would be counterproductive. Um, and you want to have just enough so that the company thrives without it becoming essentially a kind of paralysis, which does sometimes happen in those companies. Who wants to take that? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I guess just a, a thought um, to start. Um, at least my experience is it, I never get it exactly right. Um, and so I think um, being able to, I, you know, we start the book with um, the story um, that comes from Greg about working with, uh, with a group down in, in Brazil. The, it's the sneaker story, Greg, where you were talking to someone and uh, and he says, you know, that's a nice pair of sneakers you have up there. Could I have it? Uh, could I have those sneakers? And, um, and in any case, so it started with, the, so there was an exchange, you know, you gave him the sneakers and that opened doors as, as we tell the story in the book anyway. So I think Bob, what I'm, uh, what I'm getting at is I think it's important to find a way to become part of a group and, um, and um, be part of those conversations where there might be a lot of heat that hopefully generate light. And there's a constant uh, kind of um, process of kind of going deeper with clients, deepening the relationship so that you um, become part of the conversation and kind of kind of help steer the conflict in, uh, in productive ways. And at least my experience, um, I don't know what Derek and Greg would say, but often that could take years. Um, and so, you know, like uh, I've been working with my two biggest clients now, the engineering, an engineering firm in a bank for three years. And the, one of the, the partner that I've been doing that work with most closely, he says, you know, that about takes that long to understand uh, an organization. And so, I think to really understand those conflicts and what makes them pr pr productive and, and then when they tend to generate more friction, that could take some time. So it's kind of, uh, you know, I, Clifford Geertz. So this is not a simple answer to your question, but yeah, he says anthropology is deep hanging out. And so I think that's true in consulting too. It takes, it's a long time you know, long process of deep hang, hanging out where you under, really understand a client's business, understand the way they talk about it, and you build relationships and trust that gives you a lot of degrees of freedom, I think, in helping steer them in, a, in, a, in a, that conflict in a more productive, in a more productive direction. That's not a simple answer, but, but that's how I do it. Yeah, I think it's a good, I think it's a very good answer. <laughs> so, you know, uh, I, I would add that some things that Derek has already said, but the, the idea of listening, really important here, and humility. And one of the things I found now that I've gotten to know, you know, a number of really uh, well, you know, well-known leaders of major uh, corporations is that the ones who seem to be really successful in my experience of it are almost, they're almost like natural anthropologists. You know, they've, they've got a way of reading other people and situations. And I, I think there's an art that's involved in this. You know, there's just, there's not a, you're talking about getting the right, you know, fine tuning it and getting it to the right level of conflict versus uh, cooperation. You know, that's not something that will necessarily be the same in every context. And it's also one that requires a kind of sensitivity and artfulness uh, in leadership that comes, I think, in part from being a good anthropological observer, you know, having your ear to the ground, you know, what is going on out there in this organization, even knowing about it. It's often shocking to me how people don't literally don't even know what's going on just a couple of levels down from them. You know, there may be major things happening, 
In one company, I remember we did a class project on many years ago. Uh, they asked us to look in why they weren't you know, being considered uh, innovators. Uh, and it turned out that there was a huge amount of innovation going on just a couple of floors below <laughs> with new technology that if they had gotten in at the time uh, would have really propelled the corporation even further than it already is. It's already a major corporation. But why didn't that happen? You know, well, clearly at the top, number one, they weren't listening. But number two, they were also gripped with a, a culture of leadership that was emphasizing the business value of everything they did inside of the, the corporation. So they, they said, well, we're not really a technology company. You guys are proposing technology. You know, we do software. We don't do that. So defining it very, very narrowly and not really listening to what was happening inside that organization that would have, you know, been so productive for them. So I guess I would just emphasize that, you know, the art of anthropology, the art of, of ethnographic exploration and business contexts, I see as important for successful leaders. Yeah, um, what, what I would add to listening is something I think we've touched on a bit is empathy. So I, I, think, uh, I think really good leaders uh, empathize. Um, uh, and sometimes, you know, I, I was just earlier today talking with a, a team I'm working with and I, and I said, you know, sometimes though you have to make really tough decisions and if you're too empathetic, it could be hard to make those decisions. Um, so that's just the reality, I think, of business life, it, it, if you like. So, but I do think empathy is important and um, sometimes, you know, you have to, it takes coaching to help clients develop empathy and not everyone has it. You know, for example, one of my clients has been dealing with the, you know, work from home issue back to the office. Um, uh, a lot of their staff really came to like the flexibility that they had, you know, working from home. And they were just having a, a conversation on the top team. And a few of the folks said, well, why do people need flexibility? Um, so I think, you know, that's a problem uh, for them and helping them see that, you know, their experience is not necessarily shared by others is a really important part of um, helping them be more effective leaders and kind of gardeners, if you like, in, in our terms. I actually think that's a nice segue to answering one of the questions that's in the Q&A from Rachel, because I think the yeah. response is similar. Like, how do you create a narrative or an imagined community in a way that feels authentic to employees? I mean, I'll be really simplistic here, but I think just showing them that you listen to them. So like, I do this quite a bit. I'll literally, one part of many of the projects I do, I know Mario, it's the same with you, is to just tell an organization the story of, 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 of their organization. And uh, it'll, it will literally be a narrative about, you know, your sort of historical under, underpinnings, the situation you're in today, where you're going, why that's important. And um, to create that narrative, I'll literally just talk to as many people as I can in the organization at all levels. And in playing that narrative back, I'll put quotes in. I mean, I, that sounds really simplistic, but when people see your words and then their words right there. Like this is what you told me. Um, it, it shows them that you've really listened, that this is something that comes from them. And it should, gives a dose of humility, right? Like this isn't something I've sprung from, you know, that's sprung from my, you know, what I would imagine to be my brilliant consultant's mind. I'm just, I just listened to you. Tell me if this makes sense to you. Yeah, and I, you know, I, I found too, Derek, that um, I think we had this experience together. Um, many times, like sometimes there'll be comments that come out of left field that don't like fit a coherent narrative, but they're important to share. And sometimes they're shocking for leaders to, to hear, like um, just working with a company and there were a couple of comments about how, you know, revenue has been like a roller coaster and there's all this uncertainty. And um, we shared these comments with the CEO and he was really upset, but we said, we're just telling you what people said. <laughs> um, we're reflecting the reality as, as, as they, under, they understand it. And the, the other point I would make, this is also a response to Rachel's question, is I think, at least I would say, 
the more you can step in, once you engage, you develop credibility, you become a helpful insider outsider, the more you can put the clients front and center in the work, the better. So, you know, with those, those clients where we've been working, you know, like say three, four years on a set of evolving problems, more and more, it, it's really the clients who are doing the work. So a really good, let's say day long retreat might be one where I say, or my teammates say virtually nothing. And it's really the, it's really the clients who are doing the research guided by, by us. So I think the more you can involve the clients in their own problem solving, the, the, uh, the better. I think often, you know, to you, I think Derek, you were kind of touching on this, you know, sometimes clients, uh, sometimes consultants kind of, um, you know, become legends in their own minds. <laughs> they just want to retail their ideas. But I, I mean, I think our, you know, I think anthropology informed or ethnographically informed consulting is very different. It's about really um, becoming like part of the texture of the culture, but then providing those moments where you can reflect in a, in a where they can reflect in a metacultural way about where they want to, where they want to take the culture. Yeah, well, you just answered a follow-up question there. We were <laughs> going to ask you something about the, you know, how it is often the case that consultants do sort of just peddle, you know, whatever it is they they might be trained in. Um, but of course, the deep listening as you're talking or the deep hanging out and listening helps us sort of move beyond that. Um, so I guess though, with that in mind, have you ever found a situation where like time, you know, scope of the project sort of prevents you from approaching it in maybe the desired way? And would you have any suggestions of, you know, how you can make it the most productive if you're under a time crunch and you can't really spend the time to, you know, that you wish? All the time. <laughs> I, yeah. I spend so much time trying to convince the people around me that we can't just talk to like, seven or 10 senior leaders and think we know what's going on in an organization. I think we tend to be very sort of leader focused. I mean, for a couple of reasons. I mean, one is they're, they're the ones writing the checks, honestly, that's probably subconsciously part of it. Two is they are like, they're, in, they're genuinely influential. They have decision-making authority. Um, but, but then three, it's just a lot more efficient. If you have this like pyramid-like organizational structure, it's easy to cover this layer and not cover that layer. So honestly, it's a lot of times convincing people that it's worth the budget and the time to, to do that, that deep listening and to try to do it in as targeted a way as possible to say, okay, you know, Mario, Greg, and I had this wonderful experience once where we had permission to spend weeks and even months, like actually going around the world, talking to a huge, huge number of people in this global corporation in a way you mostly don't get, aren't able to. Um, but if that's not possible, can I at least do, gosh, a, a focus group in each of your regions? It doesn't feel like it's enough, but it's oftentimes better than, than you get in terms of talking to frontline employees. Yeah. Go okay. oh, go ahead. No, no, go. I was going to make two points. Um, so one, I think I've found it's important to have many different ways of engaging with clients, you know, so like that, the, the project that that Derek was just alluding to, you know, so we spent months literally traveling around the world. I think we, I think we interviewed like 500 people ultimately. Um, so you don't always get that, but so you don't always get that opportunity, but so we could do that. And then sometimes, you know, like Derek and Greg and I are asked to give an hour long talk or a workshop and you see what you could do then. Um, so, uh, you know, there's a, there's a, there's an, a, there's a whole set of ways to engage with clients. So I think having the flexibility to in, uh, engage in different ways is important. The other point I just wanted to mention, Derek, you touched on this, is I think if, if I were to write Culture Puzzle, or if we were to write Culture Puzzle 2, um, uh, which at least I'm not, because I'm still have gotten out over the exhaustion of writing the Culture Puzzle, uh, but I think the uh, another dimension would be power and authority. Have been, you know, so the reality is, you know, you have a group of like Derek said, you know, someone is paying you to do this work, and as much as you want to be authentic and objective, 
you know, we know that everybody engages in motivated reasoning. And so that's the reality of doing work. Um, but I think that's a dimension I, I would like to think more about, um, you know, the power and authority dimension. And maybe we could bring in, you know, we already brought in Bordeaux. Maybe we'd bring in a little more Foucault uh, and culture puzzle too. But, uh, you know, I think it's worth reflecting as a practitioner how you respond to power, work with power, uh, your, your ideas are shaped by it uh, or distorted by it. You know, could I just I, add? Oh, sorry, go ahead, Bob. Well, why don't you uh, express your thought and then I have a follow-up question picking up on um, your second or maybe your third book. <laughs> I just wanted to point out that the role that one can play uh, in communicating with the upper echelon, bringing to their cognizance uh, things that are actually happening at, at the lower levels that aren't valorized and you know helping to see why people are doing things the way they are and i you know was, remember one of the things working with and i don't remember which cable company it was but uh maybe it was verizon but uh the installers were quite upset because the upper management had decided in the interest of efficiency what they would do was uh, have people share trucks rather than having each have their own truck. Uh, and they would, you know, have, keep the truck working around the clock. Uh, and so the upshot of that, however, was producing inefficiency. Why? Because it turns out that inside the truck, everything is placed in positions that the person knows that is using the truck. And there are certain key things that they have, tools and so forth, that they want to get to right away. And so they put it in a spot where they know they're going to be able to get to it. And if they uh, worry that someone else is going in to use their truck, they'll try to hide it. So literally the things, the tools that they need to get to, they cannot get to. And if that can, can be communicated to people, I think it's one of the things anthropologists are good at doing mm -hmm. to be able to listen and say, you know, here's what's going on in your business. And you think you're making more money by being more efficient when the reality is that you are actually making the company less efficient. Um, so my question, uh, I, I didn't think it was going to lead in this direction and, and ask you to write another book or a third book. Um, <laughs> but it occurs to me, it occurred to me when I was reading the book that you use some terrific stories to make your key points. But as somebody alluded to in, in the chat, you know, there are a lot of metric driven managers out there. Um, and they look at this and they say, you know, it's just a series of anecdotes. Um, you know, Jillian Tett's book was like that too. And they were great anecdotes. And for us, well, that's what we love. And we know that storytelling can be extremely persuasive. But what I'm imagining and asking your reaction to, and this really just occurred to me to frame it this way, is almost as if you were to, or someone like you, to, would create a kind of mashup of the human relations area files and um, Jim Collins, Good to Great, which um, essentially takes your perspective um, about culture, about organizations, about a number of things that you talked about in the book and other things you've talked about tonight, and um, in a way quantified it, but still have the depth and substance of, of the kind of, of, of what you're saying. Is that something you think would be valuable? Would it be useful to managers? Would it put you out of the consulting business? Uh, you know, is it, is it, is, uh, what I'm really asking for is um, the question that some managers might ask is, so where's the proof? Mm -hmm. I, I think you should write that book, Bob. <laughs> I think yeah. it would, I, I, I think it would be useful, I guess. Um, so I think of a conversation I had a while back with Elizabeth Bryady. I don't know if Elizabeth's here tonight, but. Uh, she was earlier. I think she dropped, but yeah. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, she said, I'm going to I'm paraphrase her and I'm not, I'm not going to do her justice. The, the best we can do is create a kind of line of logic that, uh, that connects an intervention to what seems to be the outcome. And I, you know, and we do that narratively, you know, we make a case for the, for the impact, but if we could do that in a way that's more metric driven, uh, I would love to see it. I just, 
Uh, just speaking for myself, I've never really seen it. I've talked to a lot of people who have tried to create such a framework and it always just seems a little bit like a Procrustean bed to me, but maybe that expresses my own bias. Uh, but if we could do it, I think it would be really powerful. I don't know, dear Greg, thoughts? Yeah, I do have some thoughts on it. And, you know, the main thought is that, you know, culture as we understand it is a kind of local phenomenon. Uh, that is to say, it, it is adapted to particular circumstances and situations. And that's why it works. That's what it does for people, right? And so, uh, you know, I think what the anthropologist is really good at is getting at specifically what's going on here and now in this particular context. And that, you know, when you, you move that to the level of quantification, you lose some of that. So I, I wouldn't want us to lose that, okay? But that said, I do think that what you are suggesting is not a bad idea. That is to say, we don't wanna end up being uh, drawing conclusions that, well, if you do X, then Y is going to happen. Because between X and Y, comes those various forces of culture we've been talking about. And the basic problem with so much of the business literature that I've seen for, from management is using a correlational model. Can I get a statistically significant relationship between two variables? And even if it's a small relationship, well, we've, we've demonstrated that it exists. But why does it exist? That's where the anthropologist works well. Does that mean we can't come up with things that are going to be of broader interest? No, I, I think we can, uh, but I don't wanna throw, you know, what is I think our, our real métier, you know, out with uh, the bathwater. Well, that's not a very well formulated, <laughs> but you get the idea of what I'm talking about, right? I'm gonna use that phrase, throw the métier out with the bathwater. <laughs> two, two things to use tomorrow. <laughs> and I, I just quickly, there are two other questions in the Q&A that we haven't touched on. So maybe just quickly, Patricia, do you have any recent observations about how management by walking around has evolved during the past year of digital work from home teams? I think this is super important because there has been this narrative about the last couple of years that like, hey, we're all, you know, or many of us, certainly not all are working from home now and it works just as well as it did when we were in person. And as a working parent, I, I don't want to go back to the five day a week thing in the office, trust me. But I do think that glosses over um, something that is missing. I think, I think there might be an allusion to the fact that productivity hasn't changed and things like that because we're running still on sort of the same relationships we built up when we were in person and are relying on the quality of those relationships now when we're physically apart. And as organizations change, as new people come in that haven't been integrated into the culture, that we're, we're going, like those built up relationships won't exist anymore. And, uh, and, and you're going to then see the real problems of a fully remote environment, misalignment, it's not as productive, not as creative because we don't have the same relationships. So I do think that to counteract that, you know, what does management by walking around look like? It looks like doing something that we used to do kind of casually and informally and maybe without thinking about it um, much more intentionally. So setting up really specific one-on-one -on -one time with new people in your organization to mentor them on sort of the culture, how things work around here. That might have just been a casual conversation before, but where they don't feel comfortable enough to reach out to a more senior person um, in this moment. You know, so making those sort of casual moments of informally sharing culture a little bit more explicit. And then the other one, and how do you find clients who are on board with deep hanging out ethnographic insights? Basically, how do you break into that kind of consulting work? I think, you know, honestly, it's easier to build um, relationships with people who are already doing it and to join teams with them than to totally try to strike out on your own. So I was fortunate enough to write a book and previously to have worked with um, two of my mentors and um, you know, Greg, from an academic standpoint, and then Mario, from a professional standpoint, really brought me into this uh, consulting space. And um, that, you know, gave me the, the relationships and the ability to kind of grow on my own before I would have to start, you know, getting my own clients, which is a lot harder to do. So I think building relationships is really key. Yeah, I, and, I, and, oh, go, go ahead. ahead, go ahead. No, I wasn't going to, it was not on this topic, but I was seeing <laughs> we're running out of time. So I wanted to... Uh, just put in a plug that a lot of the questions that are being asked here are raised in the Journal of Business Anthropology, which I have been editing. I'm not gonna be editing uh, it in the future, but in particular around the COVID, we're, gonna, we're trying to put together a whole issue around what's happened culturally with COVID and the digital transformation of, of the workplace and is it gonna last and so forth. 
So if you haven't uh, checked it out, definitely check out. It's an online journal, free journal of business anthropology. And I was just going to make a, um, a quick plug for a piece by the Gartner Group. This is in response to Patricia's question about management by walking around. And uh, they described this really simple matrix. Uh, so face-to-face, -face, virtual, working together, working alone. And so that gives you the four boxes. And their point is to be intentional about you know, how you work together when you're face-to-face -face, and then like you're Zooming and, and so on and so forth. And it's you know really simple framework, but it, 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 um, it, it does two things, I think. It encourages clients to think about, well, how do we actually work in those boxes? And then how do we wanna work in those boxes? So there's a little bit of ethnography. Let's look at what's actually happening. And then a little bit of metaculture, let's reflect on ideally how we wanna do that. And so I think in this new hybrid environment, which everybody's trying to figure out and no one's you know, you know, completely figured it out on, and no one's completely on top of it. That, that's, a pretty good, that's a pretty good framework. So, hey, we have another participant. Somebody's telling me okay. it's dinner time, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Yulia, do you wanna wrap us up? Yeah, you know, there we can keep going. We have uh, endless questions, but we're going to let everybody go and enjoy their dinner with their families. Um, thank you so much to all, all three of you for joining us. Thank you. It's really a lot of fun. Thank you for having us. And um, we really enjoyed reading your book and good luck with uh, good luck with future work uh, that comes out of this process project. And Bob's book. I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and hey, let's all do this in person next time. That would be fun. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Take care. Thanks, folks. Right. Bye. Okay, bye-bye.